This is to be a lecture on active mind, um, and it's a um, continuation, follow-up, or further developments from the view of mind that, and perception that has been offered by Immanuel Kant. Um, so I revisit some of those same themes, the, the passive theory of perception or the passive metaphors for perception that we see in British empiricism, Kant's challenge to that, and uh, we'll take it from there. So with that in mind, let me share my screen. Okay, active mind. We'll do a quick review of Locke, although that's probably still fresh in your minds, hopefully. Um, I'm gonna introduce you to some uh, additional philosophers like Nelson Goodman, and, um, and maybe have a little more fun by the end of the presentation. So we're talking about experience, art, and understanding. This is a, a lecture that I um, repurposed from a lecture I had created when I was teaching a course called Art, Mind, and Cognitive Science. So there are some art references in here. I left them in because they're a little more fun than, um, and, and they give examples of some of the things we're trying to talk about. So I'm gonna talk very briefly about classical empiricism's passive account of perception, because this is something we spent a fair amount of time on already, so I don't need to go over it in detail. Um, in, the, in the art, mind, and cognitive science class, we maybe would not have covered that at all, so I, I would spend some more time, but I'll breeze through that. And of course, the next bullet down, we just finished Kant's um, active theory of mind in this course, so I won't spend a lot of time on that. I'll just um, rehearse it just slightly. But then we'll move on to uh, experience not as a given, uh, but rather constituted by active mind. And we'll conclude by looking at some Gestalt principles and, um, and, uh, and, and uh, examples of active mind coming from art. So recall John Locke was one of the three British empiricists. And he's committed to the idea that there were no such thing as innate ideas and that the best way of coming to know objective truth was via sensory experience. However, uh, he's pointing out that nothing is in the mind that wasn't first in the senses. In this sense, he agrees with Thomas Aquinas and then perhaps earlier with, with Aristotle. And we begin life as a tabula rasa, blank slate. So these are points we've already uh, covered. There is the world. And there are our ideas about the world. And then this view places critical importance on determining what is the connection between reality and our minds. And how can we move from our ideas about the world to claims about the mind independent objective world? To this end, he offered the causal theory of perception, which is that the world interacts with our perceiving organs and causes ideas to occur in our mind. Locke uses the word idea very broadly, nearly any mental event counts as an idea. Therefore, again, the world causes our ideas about it. So you'll recall this is the same uh, drawing that we had in ours, right? There's the external world, the apple. There's the perceiving organ, the eye. And there's the mental image or the mental representation, the idea of the apple. We talked about simple and complex ideas in the previous um, lecture, so I don't really need to go over that here. We also talked about primary and secondary properties in the previous lecture. I'll briefly say this, though, that remember for Locke, the secondary properties are properties that occur in our minds, but are not actual properties of the world. So key to Locke's understanding is um, we can go from mental representations to knowledge about the world, but we have to be careful not to ascribe secondary properties to the world itself. Secondary properties are merely properties of our perception of the world. The primary properties are the real stuff, and that's what we need to concentrate on. And not surprisingly, the primary properties, according to Locke, roughly turn upon the kind of physical mechanistic properties that physics and chemistry were talking about round about the same time. This is different ways of knowing the difference. We talked about this. Of the properties of an apple, red, round, sweet, and solid, how do they break down? Well, we know red is secondary uh, color. Round is primary because it's shape. Sweet would be secondary. Solid would be primary. So the world um, 
uh, again, is just the physical objects that we are perceiving. So we talked about this already. I'm going to skip by it. Physical substance, remember for Locke, was something I know not what. It's the, the, uh, where the primary properties reside. He thought they have to reside in something. And what might that something be? He kind of hypothesizes physical substance. Therefore, our ideas are caused by physical substance. All ideas are mediated by your senses. What causes the ideas are uh, is the physical substance with which we can never have direct contact. So that's a brief summary of Locke's causal theory of perception. Now, this raises all sorts of properties. Again, what is the relationship, um, questions rather, what is the relationship between our ideas, et cetera? And again, he had skeptical worries that are similar to those which were uh, first introduced to us by, by Descartes, right? But these sort of matrix type uh, worries. All right, moving on. So again, in classical empiricism, the mind is seen as passive. Again, his metaphor is a tabula rasa, a blank slate. And we talked about that, of course, earlier. But again, it's hard to imagine being more passive than being an inert bit of rock waiting for the world to come and write on you. Hume, a little bit later than Locke, uh, argues that the mind receives impressions. Well, again, this is a rather passive metaphor for the nature of perception. And even the 20th century philosopher Bertrand Russell uh, refers to mind uh, getting bare particulars in experience. Again, these are passive metaphors. This is not the first nor the last time that an unhelpful metaphor is, impedes actual understanding. Again, what Kant is going to suggest is that the, the poverty of um, of this view, and also more by extension, the poverty of the rationalist and empiricist uh, conceptions of knowledge in the early part of modern philosophy were due in fact to this unhelpful, misleading metaphor that the mind is passive in perception. And he thinks the correction to that is to point out that the mind is not passive, but rather active, and that our experience is the product of active mind. Um, okay, so again, here's what how, how Locke thought it was supposed to work, right? That you have some physical substance out there interacting with our perceiving organs and creating the uh, idea in our mind. But again, Immanuel Kant marks an important development in the philosophy and conceptions of mind, right? We talked about how rationalism and empiricism both seem inadequate to account for human knowledge. Rationalism seems unable to account for knowledge of the world of our experience, whereas empiricism seemed to be unable to account for the necessary truths of math and geometry, and even the universality of natural laws, the laws of physics, etc. Taken to their logical extremes, both rationalism and empiricism seems to end in skepticism the skepticism of Descartes or the skepticism of Hume. Locke's solution to, I'm sorry, Kant, Kant's solution to the impasse was to revision the very nature of knowledge and experience. The mind does not merely receive information in the act of perception. The mind shapes that information and constructs experience out of the raw sense data that the world provides. Again, the mind does not mirror the world, but rather takes and makes experience, takes and makes the world of our experience. Mind constructs experience out of the raw sense data that the world provides. This is sometimes referred to as Kant's Copernican revolution in epistemology. Rather than asking how uh, is knowledge or understanding possible, Kant asks instead, how is it that knowledge and understanding is possible? Rather than asking, how does knowledge impress itself onto the mind, passive metaphor, Kant asks, how does the mind construct experience? It is necessary to see human experience as having different content, but a consistent form. If we were to abstract all the content from human experience, we would arrive at the pure form of human experience. 
Again, think of a blank template into which the mind pours all the information and thus arrives at a coherent experience. The metaphor I gave in our lecture on Kant was think of my very old mail list program that can only organize records according to one and only one pattern. Thus, I have knowledge of how my 100th record, or any other record for that matter, will look in broad outline in advance of actually reviewing my 100th record. That is, I can have a kind of a priori knowledge of my 100th record. I can't know the content of my 100th record, but I can know the form. Why? Because once I become familiar with the organizing principle of this mail list program, and how it configures data and how it configures the records, then I can recognize the pattern and I can see that that pattern never changes. So I can know in advance that the first field of my 100th record will be first name and that the second field of my 100th record will be second name. Why? Because that's how this program organizes things. My knowledge is not grounded in the particular experience of my 100th record, though it is grounded in experience in general, specifically in experience with the program. Though I don't know what the content of the record is, I know the form. Because when I'm referring to the program's records, I'm referring to the product of its organizing function, which does not and cannot change. Another illustration of what Kant might have in mind would be those magic eye posters. At one moment, they look like a flat two-dimensional image, and the next they look like a three-dimensional image. So this is a rendering of a magic eye poster, but it doesn't work as a, as a slide on a PowerPoint. I've tried that a couple of times for years. It just doesn't. Um, and you may not know what magic eye posters are. They haven't been nearly as popular as they were in the 1990s. But essentially, they're a computer-generated image. This would be one. And it is such that under certain conditions, it simply looks like a flat two-dimensional abstract uh, field. And then under other conditions, it actually looks like a three-dimensional, where you can actually see objects with, with uh, spatial dimensions. <laughs> In person, they really are quite impressive um, if you've ever had that experience. So uh, what, is, and what is the difference then from one moment to the next, right? The, at the moment that that poster is um, uh, uh, providing you with a two-dimensional visual experience, and the next moment when that same, very same poster is providing you with a three-dimensional visual experience, is the poster giving you something different the first time than it's giving you the second time or vice versa? Well, of course, the answer to that is no. The difference is not what the poster is providing. The difference is what your mind is doing with what is providing, what is being provided at it. In the first case, your mind is taking the data and turning it into a two-dimensional visual experience. In the second case, your mind is taking the very same data and turning it into a three-dimensional visual experience. Again, this demonstrates then that the mind is not merely receiving the data, it's receiving and interpreting the data. And depending on how it interprets the data, uh, you may have one visual experience or a quite different visual experience. Kant is very specific about these forms and categories of experience, but I'm only gonna sp uh, spend time looking at space and time, what Kant called the two pure forms of experience. All human experience will and must conform to three-dimensional Euclidean space, according to uh, Kant, and all human experience will and must conform to unidirectional time, where we have a constant temporal moving from past through present to future. Now, this opens the door to a radical relativism, because if our experience of the world is a product of what the world provides and what we do with it, well, then if I do something different with, my, uh, with what the world provides than you do, then um, I'm making up truth for me, and it's different than the truth you're making up for you. Right? So now Kant did not believe that, though. Kant thought that all human beings construct their worlds, their experience, in exactly the same way. 
And so if we are both constructing the world, given the same data, running the same organizing programs, we're going to have the same knowledge. So for Kant, despite the fact that knowledge is indeed subjective, it's also universal in the same way that a Word document is universal across any computer running Word. Right? Now, if you aren't running Word, if you're running Google Docs or you're running Pages or you're running Word Star, well, you may not construct the document in exactly the same way. And it's not that you're doing something wrong and I'm doing something right. We're just doing something different. We're just constructing our documents differently according to different properties. If that's the case, then you can have two very different pictures of the universe. Both are equally valid or equally, um, well, leave it at that, equally valid. But that's the, that's the nub of relativism then. There are no objective principles by which to decide between these two competing worldviews. So I just said that. So this model of uh, experience, experience as interpretation, can transfer to other modes of perception as well. Consider hearing your native language spoken. Well, you're just hearing it as, um, as meaningful uh, words, right? If it's a language you're quite familiar with, you don't feel like you're interpreting, you don't feel like you're processing, but in fact you are. Think about an individual who's not familiar with that language or perhaps who has to struggle, right? They're starting to learn the language. Well, they might be able to attribute meaning to the spoken words, but it's going to be a challenge and they very much feel like they're interpreting or trying to interpret. So sometimes the interpretation is so automatic, so second nature that you're not even aware of the fact that you're doing it. But what the active mind theory is claiming is, yeah, but you are, you are actively constructing your experience. Or think of wine tasting or x-ray reading. I think I maybe mentioned that in an earlier uh, lecture, but I don't know about you, but unless it's very obvious, I can't make heads or tails of an x-ray. And yet someone trained in x-ray interpretation can determine all sorts of things like fractures, etc., and the extent of a fracture, which I remain totally ignorant of, uh, or, or identifying bird calls, or perhaps even uh, this kind of thing goes on in determining art and uh, visual mechanisms in art. Despite the fact that these cases uh, of perception may seem automatic, there's nothing basic or just given in the perception. Still, despite Kant's insight, there persists the myth of the pure empirical fact. Classical empiricism would claim that perception is automatic and in a sense biological. So on that classical empiricist view of perception, which as I said, I think it's incorrect, but on that view, then to get the accurate perception, you wanna be as uh, impassive as possible. You want to be as impassive as possible. You want to be completely neutral. You want to be uh, just uh, open and not active at all. And that's the idea, because if you do any interpreting, the idea is you might be biasing the uh, observation. But on the active mind theory of experience, you can't do that. You wouldn't have intelligible experience at all if you were completely passive. So the 20th century philosopher and art, uh, uh, there's two individuals, 20th century philosopher and an art historian applies this notion to art. Ernest Gombridge uh, was an art historian and Nelson Goodman, a 20th century philosopher. Um, they uh, influenced one another, but what they both agreed on is that the mind is not passive in experience, but rather active. And Gombridge did all kinds of interesting um, research on how your expectations actually affect your experience of a work of art, uh, uh, how you engage in it, what you take away, um, what you notice, what you fail to notice. So in other words, what you bring to the experience of the art has a lot to do with what that art experience is going to be like. No surprise there, right? Because experiencing the art is a factor of, uh, is a matter rather of interpreting the art. Nelson Goodman as a philosopher makes quite the same 
uh, claim. This insight is crucial to understanding what is going on in art, among a great many other things they claim. Nelson Goodman, like Kant, denies the simple passive view of perception. There are no bare particulars. There are no innocent eyes. The mind is active from the onset. The shape and content of experience and perception depend on the work that the mind does, focusing um, the past experiences, setting up expectations, priming certain uh, uh, outcomes, uh, and again, setting up expectations. Perception is a matter of focusing, ignoring, overlooking, and interpreting. Notice, I think that's something I like to emphasize, is that to focus is the flip side uh, of ignoring. In order to focus, you have to ignore. Uh, thus, there are no difference, there is no difference between perceiving and interpreting, according to Goodman. Nelson Goodman acknowledges that perception may be automatic, but that does not mean passive. It does not mean inevitable. Notice that hearing a remark, as I mentioned before, in your native language, you cannot but help but hear it as a sequence of intelligible, meaningful sounds. Goodman argued against the persistent myth of the pure empirical fact. Classical empiricism would claim that perception is automatic, non-cognitive, or minimally so, and merely biological. But Goodman insists that perception is not non-cognitive, and that what we see is a direct result of how we've been trained to read the world. So one of the interesting things about Goodman is he thought that um, even very realistic paintings succeed in referring to objects in the world, not by looking just like the real thing, right? Uh, a very common view. Oh, why does that, why, how is it that that uh, painting achieves a reference to, I don't know, um, uh, George Washington? Well, because it looks just like George Washington. Right. And so the idea of resemblance as the mechanism for reference in paintings is widely held even today. But Goodman argues, and I think he argues rather convincingly, against that idea. And he says, no, we actually had to learn to read paintings in the same way that we had to learn to read English sentences or, or hear uh, language acquisition. And so paintings succeed in reference in the same way that language receive, succeeds in reference by utilizing symbol systems that we have been inducted into. Someone unfamiliar with the symbol system wouldn't understand a realistic painting or what to do with it or what it refers to any more than listening to a language with which that individual was unfamiliar. He tells a story about um, uh, researchers going to a, a, a village, a non-technical village, unfamiliar with um, photography, and showing to the villagers there photographs of the village and people in the village, and they had no idea what to make of them. So the, the photographs did not succeed in referring to the objects photographed for these villagers because they didn't know how to interpret the image. Again, it was like speaking to them in a language with which they were unfamiliar. Goodman's model for perception can clearly be seen in other modes of uh, perception, as I mentioned, wine tasting, x-ray reading, bird calls. Okay, I said that already. Again, I like this quote by Gombridge, the eye comes always ancient to its work, obsessed by its own past and by old and new insinuations of ear, nose, tongue, fingers, heart, and brain. Again, Kant, uh, Gombridge and Goodman are echoing the Kantian insight that the mind is not passive in experience, but rather active. Again, Locke thought it was enough to talk about the object, the perceiving organ, and the perception. On this view, the object impresses itself on the mind, and the mind is simply the inert, passive recipient of the information. Kant, Gombridge, and Goodman argue against the model that model rather, claiming it is insufficient to account for experience. For another example, think of the visual ambiguous images, specifically think of the duck rabbit image. You might be familiar with it. If not, I'll show you one in a moment. This phenomenon shows why the old model of passive perception 
is inadequate for understanding how perception actually works. So here is the duck rabbit image. Now notice you can look at this image and you can interpret it as a duck. Or you can look at this very same image and interpret it as a rabbit. But notice that poses the problem for the passive view of perception. Oh, here's another duck rabbit image. Here's another duck rabbit image. So notice from this perspective, it's not, uh, it's probably just as easy to see it as a duck as it is a rabbit, right? From here, I think it's a little easier to see it as a duck. Here, I think it's a little easier to see it as a rabbit. And here it sort of splits the difference. But again, it's an ambiguous image. This was supposed to be a three-dimensional duck rabbit. I'm not sure it's entirely successful. But now we see the problem with Locke's passive view of mind. So we can fancy him up a little bit by talking about a retinal image. And so on the whoops, on this fancier document, we've got the external world, there's the apple, the perceiving organ, there's the eye. And we can talk about the retinal image, right? That image that appears on our retina, right? Um, and then we could talk about the percept. But even this more complicated, more neurologically informed picture of perception can't get the job done when it comes to the duck rabbit. In the case of the duck rabbit, I can see a duck or I can see a rabbit. That is, I could have a duck perception or a rabbit perception, and which perception I have cannot be explained in terms of the object or the organ or the retinal image. Why? Well, because in this case, the object, the organ, and the retinal image are identical, but the percepts are different. So that means then there must be something else going on behind, um, besides the mere passive reception of uh, information. There's an interpretive act. Again, there must be some other factor which explains the difference in perception. And that factor is the activity of mind. The old Lockean model simply cannot account for this phenomenon. After Kant, theorists argue against the passive accounts of mind and knowledge and emphasize the role and faculty of imagination in the formation of experience. This opens the door to the position that there's not merely one right way to experience or to know. If our experience of the world is a product of what the world gives us and what we do with it, right, how we image it, then it follows that there are, or at least there may be many different experiences of the world as there are imagers, and no one is in a privileged position with respect to its rivals. This realization gives rise to postmodern notions that there is no one point of view from which the capital T truth can be determined. With regard to art, they questioned the old Aristotelian belief that art and literature, like science, should concern one general, uh, the general features of nature. So we can talk about distal, proximal uh, uh, stimuli and percepts. The root of distal is related to the English word for distance, and it means the stimulus that's at the outside or most distant. Proximal essentially means near or close to, or to make or to make come close to. And the percept comes from the say root, but it, uh, it, uh, it means to make concrete, to catch or uh, what is caught. Uh, that's uh, what we end up with after the initial processing and uh, we can use for further processing. So for example, when you see somebody walking down the hallway away from you, you don't think, oh, good heavens, that person is shrinking, despite the fact that the image on your retina is doing precisely that. So as that person recedes from your vision, your retinal image, that's your your proximal stimuli is diminishing, right? As the distal stimulus recedes, the proximal stimuli diminishes, it gets to be smaller. But you don't think, oh, so look, at he's turning into a tiny little person. Further, if the person were shrinking, 
the image on your retina would be pretty much the same, but you would most likely misinterpret that as the person moving away from you. Notice this is how movies work, right? When you're sitting in a movie, the image on the screen gets smaller and smaller as the character on the screen is walking away from the camera. But we don't interpret that as the person getting smaller. We don't even really often interpret it as the image getting smaller. We interpret it as the image moving away from us. Why is that? Well, one explanation is that because we have been adapted to live in the real world, and in the real world, that sort of visual simulation, a diminishing retinal image, is far more often tied to objects retreating from our view than from objects staying at a fixed position, but shrinking. So we develop this sort of biological uh, visual heuristic of interpreting our mental images. So the mental image is getting smaller, and then the active interpretation we ascribe to it is the distal uh, stimulus is retreating from our vision. A heuristic is a strategy for organizing a great deal of information quickly via a rule of thumb. We're examining each datum individually is not practical. These are used to control and facilitate problem solving in human beings and in machines, etc. You do develop these sort of rules of thumb of, of processing information. So we have this sort of visual heuristic uh, of interpreting a diminishing image on our uh, retina. Our visual systems must be able to construct depth information from the two-dimensional uh, two image that falls upon our retina. This requires perceptual heuristic, which Gestalt theory uh, refers to as size constancy. So the, the, the heuristic presumption is that the object remains size constant, and therefore the diminishing image is uh, explained by the the object, which is remaining the same size, actually retreating from you. We find depth cues and use them to interpret the retinal image and come up with a depth independent size. We automatically judge the object of our perception to be remaining the same size. This assumption is what allows us to further judge that its relative speed, location, and trajectory. So on the assumption that the object is remaining the same size, we're thereby able to see, is it moving towards us or away from us? And how quickly, uh, what's the trajectory, et cetera. So we get a lot of information about that object, but it presumes that the object is remaining the same size and that's the interpretation we ascribe to it. These heuristics are valuable under normal life circumstances but they allow us to set up all sorts of peculiar illusions under abnormal circumstances. For instance, given two circles of the same size, one surrounded by large circles and the other by small circles, the circles surrounded by small circles will appear to be larger. This is because our visual system uses the size of surrounding um, the, the object, the context circles, as a relative depth hue. Because the circle with smaller surrounding circles is judged to be farther away, the size of the circle is judged to be larger. Or perhaps you've seen this illusion, right? If I asked you which of the two yellow bars is longer than the other, I've already said it's an illusion, so maybe you're on to me, uh, but um, most people would say the top one, right? The one nearer the top of the image than the one at the bottom. Now, as you probably uh, can anticipate, both yellow bars are exactly the same length, but it doesn't appear to us that way because we tend to take those converging um, train track type images uh, moving towards a vanishing point as a depth cue. And so we're assuming that the, the horizontal black bars are uh, spaced uniformly. And the only reason they don't appear uniformly is because the tracks are retreating into the distance. And on that idea, then that means that the yellow bar further away from us is the one on top. And then one nearer to us is uh, on the bottom. Now, if that's the case, if the yellow bar 
on the top is further away and the yellow bar on the bottom is closer to us. And yet they both are creating the same image uh, length on our retina. Well, then it must be the case that the bar further away is longer than the bar closer to us. Right? Otherwise, uh, it would be um, it would be smaller, just as the black bars are. Right. Anyway, uh, I'm not saying that this is something you think in your head. I'm saying this is something that you automatically interpret. Right. It's part of the activity of your mind in interpreting your experience. The presence of a vanishing point is suggested by the acute angle. It can be enough to make us perceive a size difference even between lines of equal length when they differ in distance from that angle. In both cases, the size of the retinal images for the shapes involved are identical. In other words, the proximal stimuli are identical in terms of length on our retina. But our visual system gives us the percept that the two shapes differ in size. Under normal circumstances, the proximal stimuli would only be the, um, the, then the same if the distal stimulus in the three-dimensional scene were further away than the other. I mentioned that already. That's a link that I won't open. Uh, so uh, Gestalt principles are these generalizations about patterns by which our minds create or construct experience. Uh, once relegated to mere generalizations, more recently neuroscience has been discovering the explanatory basis for these automatic perceptual mechanisms. Gestalt psychology was formulated prior to First World War um, by the German uh, Max Wertheimer. Well, never mind, you don't need to know all that. Uh, but perceptual holes are somehow prior to the perceptual parts. Gestaltists identified a number of principles that are presumed to govern the formation of perceptual holes. In contrast to the behaviorist, Gestaltists place much less, less emphasis on the role of learning in perception. So it seems that these are more um, uh, almost neurologically based rather than uh, culturally acquired principles. Why? Because they're generalizations across, that are cross-cultural and um, they, they uh, appear very early on in the development of our cognitive systems. So again, they're what psych uh, psychologists would refer to as probably bottom-up principles rather than top-down, right? Sort of neurologically based rather than culturally acquired. Now, this holes to parts business, notice, go back to the train tracks and the yellow bars for a moment. Notice you are interpreting the yellow bars as part of an entire system, right? That whole system. So in other words, your, uh, your interpretation of the individual parts is premised on your gestalting the entire scene. So one gestalt principle is the principle, uh, principle of similarity. Similar objects tend to be perceived as grouped together. Similar can be understood across uh, one or more dimensions, such as similar in shape or color, orientation, et cetera, right? But here's what they have in mind, right? Notice <laughs> yeah, the image to the right here. It, we tend to see that as a series of columns rather than as a series of rows. And why is it? Well, because the items are similar um, in terms of vertical columns and in a way that they are not similar in terms of horizontal roles, uh, rows rather. So uh, here's an example of the, um, the principle of uh, similarity explaining why we tend to perceive one way over another. Proximity is a second uh, grouping principle. And again, we tend to group things that are close to one another um, together. So again, here, Similarity isn't playing much of a role because all of the objects are similar to one another, but we tend to see this as columns and not row. I'm sorry, we tend to see this as rows, not columns. And why is it? Well, because the objects are uh, grouped, uh, are closer together, are more proximate. If you view them as rows, than they are if you view them as columns. Now, 
can you re-gestalt it? In other words, with some effort, can you change your perception and focus and, and re-gestalt it so that you attend to columns rather than rows? Yes, you can, right? Or at least I can, I imagine you can as well. But the question here is, uh, what do you tend to do most naturally? So again, if you're developing a web page, right? You're trying to design a web page. Uh, you don't want to design a web page where people have to re-gestalt your web page in order to interpret uh, or find things or know where to click. You want to play into their um, their gestalt tendencies, right? The web pages that are most easy to navigate are the ones which are intuitive. Uh, things are kind of where you expect them and where you expect them to be or how you tend to group things together turns upon, again, these sort of gestalt principles. I said that already. Good continuation is another uh, gestalt principle. We tend to see things as uh, uh, continuous, right? What do I have in mind here? Here we tend to see this as a triangle that is laying on top of three uh, circles right? Three purplish circles and a white triangle on top. Now notice, there are no circles there. There also is no triangle. And yet, it's, easiest to, it's easy to see a kind of triangle over um, uh, three circles rather than these sort of three Pac-Man figures all trying to eat each other or something like that, right? Um, you could re-gestalt it, right? But the tendency is to see it as a triangle in three circles. And why is that? It's the principle of good continuation, right? We tend to want to continue this line and this line and this line. Whoa. Well, I didn't mean to do that, but it's just as well that I did. Here's another example of good continuation. If I was going to say, um, uh, you know, name, uh, what would you see as the, uh, the continuous lines here? Well, you would say line AD and line uh, BC. That was fine. But notice you could have said, oh, I see line AB as touching uh, line CD, like two pyramids coming together or something like that. But that tends not to be your initial way. So you, you could re gestalt it, as I said, but the tendency is to see it as two um, uh, continuous lines and not uh, two right angles meeting. Again, we tend to see a curved line here, despite the fact that there is no single undulating curved line. Here, we have um, the principle of closure, where we tend to want to close up things. It's kind of like a proximity. Well, I'll take that back. So notice, um, we tend to see this as three um, squares, with a, an isolated figure on the left-hand side, right? So three squares, one, two, three, and then the sort of isolated figure over here. Right. Right. But if we removed these lines here, right? Which is suggesting squareness. If we remove them, we have this, and here we would tend to see it as three parallel uh, lines with a lonely figure on the right-hand side. So whereas this ends up being the lonely figure given good continuation and closure, this becomes the lonely figure given proximity. So aesthetically interesting things can happen when you start to play with these ideas right? This is a surrealist painting. And it starts to, initially, it doesn't seem problematic. And then you go, wait, wait a minute, what's going on there? What? Wait, I, right. And it's because you're trying to close things up and see good continuation. And the, and the painting is frustrating that. Right. So I find it rather interesting. This is a, um, a um, principle called symmetry. And we tend to see uh, things uh, symmetric things as the object or what's called the uh, the ground. I'm sorry, the figure rather, the figure. And we tend to see the asymmetry as the ground. So uh, what do I have in mind here? Well, we see this as being a figure 
and this as being a figure and the white as being the background. Right? So we see the black here as the figures foreground and we see the white as a background. But try to regestalt it, and you can if you if you work at it. Try to regestalt it and see this as white asymmetric figures against black background. Right? It's a little bit of a challenge because it's really fighting with a very strong gestalt principle, but it can be done. Okay. Again, there's a principle called smallness, and again, the tendency here is to see this as a black cross against a, uh, in a white circle, and not to see this as a white cross in a black circle. Right? Could you regestalt it? Yes, but it would take some effort, right? The tendency, given smallness, is to see the, the figure as the smaller of the two, and the, and the, and the ground as the larger of the two. This is, uh, uh, again, uh, um, illustrating that same thing, right? It's easy to see this as um, <laughs> the figure and the white as the ground. And when you do, we see this as a, a goblet or maybe a candlestick, but let's say a goblet, right? Here, it's hard to see it as a goblet. It's a lot easier to see it as two uh, faces. In the same way, here it's easier to see it as the figure, and here it's easier to see it as the ground. Now, if I said to you, below this text here is a word, what is the word that you see? You might have a hard time seeing the word that is uh, listed here. And if you're having a hard time, the reason you're having a hard time is because you're focusing on the black items as the figures. Try to focus on the black as a background. Try to focus on the white spaces between the black as the figure, right? And see if you can figure out what word is being um, presented here. Right? I'll give it another moment. Again, you're looking at the white in between the black, and you're trying to imagine the white as the figure and the black as a kind of background to the figure. Okay, perhaps this will help. Do you see it now? And perhaps this further would help. Do you see the word tie? T I E, tie. Maybe you do. If you don't, let me know. Okay. Um, common fate is another Gestalt principle, which it talks about when objects are all moving in the same direction, say like a flock of birds or that sort of thing. We tend to Gestalt it all together, right? As a single moving object. Uh, skip that. We've already mentioned the difference between bottom up and top down processing, cognitive processing. Uh, bottom up implies uh, that the uh, is implied when the effects are seen uh, early on in the processing, and previous experience or acquired conceptual frameworks play little role. Top down, the effects are seen later on in the perceptual processing, and previous experience or acquired conceptual frameworks, uh, like contexts and explanations, etc., significantly affect the outcome. Most formal properties, the kind formalists like to refer to, are acquired in the act of perception early and seemingly acquire, acquired knowledge plays little role. In many cases, uh, these features seem to be cognitively impenetrable. In other words, you can't, you can't deny them. Therefore, it would seem that they are best understood as bottom-up processing items. For abilities like object recognition, word recognition, face processing, however, our previous experience and acquired arsenal of concepts is not only very important, but influences our perception. Thus, this then would be top-down processing. So two different ways uh, we end up interpreting the contents of our experience, and we structure and manufacture our experience, top-down and bottom-up. 
Top down is again, often considered to be neurologically based. It tends not to be um, immediately cognitive in the sense of acquired learning. And, um, uh, and, and, and Gestalt principles tend to be these kinds of, uh, did I say top down? Hopefully I didn't screw that up. Let me try again. So bottom up is this sort of immediate non-cognitive kinds of responses we have to our visual um, uh, uh, data that we receive. Um, and it happens early on. It's sometimes cognitively impenetrable, meaning we can't undo it. And um, it affects how we interpret the data uh, we receive in visual experience. Top down, by contrast, is um, happens later on in the processing of the visual experience. It tends to be affected by expectations, by prior learning, et cetera, and sort of culturally acquired. So here's a, uh, another uh, challenging image, right? So again, if you focus on the black as the figure, you're not going to see what is being uh, presented here, right? You're gonna have, a, well, let's rephrase, you're gonna have a very different visual experience than one who is not concentrating on black as the figure. Now, if you merely concentrate on the white as the figure, again, you're not going to have, um, you're going to have, a, a, again, a different visual experience. But if I tell you something different, if I said, look, this is actually a face, can you see the face here? That means that some of the black is figure and some of the black is background, some of the white is figure, some of the white is background, and you have to apply a different standard to it. So, um, of course, if this were an actual class, I could be asking you, who here sees it as a face? Does anyone see it as a face? Uh, this one sometimes drives students nuts uh, that they don't see it as a face at all, no matter how hard they try. But this is what's called the grouping problem, right? How do we know what elements to put with what so as to interpret what we see? Otherwise, these random splotches are seen as a face if and only if we bind the features together in a certain way. So here's another rendering of the image, right? Imagine that here's are the eyes and these are the eyebrows. This is the bridge of the nose. These are the lips. This is the ear over here. This is just plain old background, okay? This is the head, right? So we see that that's the head. This is the cheekbone. Here's the chin. Do you see the face here? And if you can see the face here, whoops, perhaps now you can see the face here, right? Again, here's the nose, right? Here's the, here's the lips, here's the chin, here's the ear. Okay. Do you see something here? Well, don't read, don't read, don't read. Okay, now you can read. Do you see a Dalmatian? Right. This is one of the things that, um, you know, this is how you prove you're not a robot because to date, they haven't quite figured out how to get artificial intelligence to bind the appropriate objects together. So you're able to see a, a Dalmatian, whereas um, a, a, um, it's not clear how uh, artificial intelligence would know uh, that, you know, oh, here's the dog's ear and here's the collar and here's uh, his rear leg and here's his foreleg, and, right? So you're able to somehow bind these black and white dots together in such a way that you have a visually coherent experience. So here's another uh, rather interesting thing, right? So here's just a visual uh, uh, field. Um, I'm curious as to which, if any of you, can see a snake. Does any of you see a snake? Let's try this. Do you see the snake now? Ah, well, if you know that this is the head and here's the body of the snake, okay, do you see the snake now? And right, now try to still see it. Did it just disappear or do you still see the snake? Okay. Again, here's the head, here's the body. And here's the end of it. But again, here, it's a little bit more difficult to bind, right? So not only would I have, uh, would a computer artificial intelligence have a hard time binding, uh, I'm having a hard time binding. <laughs> and, and I'm not, I am a human. And that's how camouflage works. 
Here's our famous uh, duck rabbit image, which we already talked about. Uh, this is a painting by Salvador Dali, and I believe it's called uh, Bust of Voltaire and Two Nuns, uh, Disappearing Bust of Voltaire. Wait, what is it? It, uh, it might be this, Two Nuns in the Marketplace with Disappearing Bust of Voltaire. I think that's what it's called, okay? Something like that. I should have looked it up, but I didn't. Um, but anyway, do you see the nuns in the marketplace? Do you see the bust of Voltaire? Well, if you gestalt this as his uh, head and this as his forehead, and here's his uh, cheekbones, and here's his chin, and here's uh, a little bit of his neck, and this is a shadow cast by his chin, right? Well, now you can perhaps see the bust of Voltaire. But when you're looking at the nuns, the bust of Voltaire sort of disappears, and this just becomes background. Instead of figure, it becomes ground, right? Um, but when it becomes uh, uh, when it becomes figure, uh, the, the the nuns tend to disappear. So, all right. Anyway, Salvador Dali liked playing games like that. All right, test. Prepare to write down what you see. Well, if this were a class, you'd actually write it down. You know, but we won't. You don't really need to write it down. Right. I'm going to uh, click, uh, show you the slide for a moment or two, and then unclick. Okay, what did you see? Well, some of you might have said uh, a saxophone player, and some of you might have said a woman's face, and some of you might have said, I saw both a saxophone player and a woman's face. Good for you if you did. Right. But let's take a look at it again. Okay. So if you concentrate on this is an eye and this is a nose and this is lips and a mouth and this is a chin, you're looking at a woman's face. But if you concentrate on this is a big kind of a nose of a man who's playing a large saxophone and this is his foot and this is his, the heel of his shoe and this is his back, well, then you see the saxophone player. Okay. How about this? What did you see? Perhaps uh, that's actually a very often repeated image. So you might already have seen that in another class or another context. But some of you perhaps saw a young woman and some of you might have seen um, a, a less attractive, somewhat older woman. And some of you may have seen both, right? It's unusual if this is the first time you're seeing the image to see both, right? Um, I remember uh, years ago when I was first um, engaged with us. I saw one of the two. I couldn't see the other. It was very difficult for me to see the other. And then eventually I learned to see the other. But let's go back. So if uh, you see this as a, a young woman looking away from you, right? So she's got her head, whoop, I didn't mean that, whoop, whoop, that she has her head turned away from you. And this is her nose and this is her eyelash and this is her hair and she's wearing kind of a fancy hat uh, and this is her shoulder and maybe she has a little choker a necklace on or something like that. And this is her, uh, you know, her uh, chin or, or whatever like this, right? Um, and this is her ear, okay? Well, then you're seeing this young woman, right? On the other hand, if you see this as a rather large nose and kind of a pointy chin, and that's a mouth, right? And this is an eye looking at you, right? Um, maybe this is even a wart of some sort. Uh, well, then you might see perhaps a less attractive, somewhat older woman, okay? Of course, it depends on how you gestalt it. And that was kind of the whole point of this little uh, exercise, right? To talk about how our experience of the world is a product of what the world uh, provides and what we do with it. Again, the activity of our minds in interpreting these experiences. And so this was supposed to be a little bit of a fun way of illustrating that. Okay. I hope it was useful to you. Whoops. Naturally, uh, if you have questions or would like to discuss any of this with me further, please, please do contact me. And until next time.